Neutron stars aren't dark matter, we figured that out a while ago. But new research is telling us that they may be dark matter factories. They may produce the exotic Axion, one of the most popular dark matter candidates. To understand reality, we need to understand its built-in blocks. The standard model of particle physics does a great job of describing all known particles. The three generations of quarks and leptons, plus the bosons that carry the four fundamental forces, plus the mass-granting Higgs particle. But there are a few holes in the Stanton model that we need to fill if we want the full picture. One of those holes is the so-called strong CP problem. It's been called one of the most underrated puzzles in all of physics, probably because it's such an abstract problem that it's really hard to describe in non-math terms. We gave it a shot in this video, but the long story short is that the strong force is expected to violate charge parity symmetry. Flipping charge and then doing a mirror reflection of, say, a proton or a neutron should not get you back where you started. But in quantum chromodynamics, it seems to do exactly that. The most popular way to fix this problem is to introduce a new quantum field that eliminates the CP violating terms in QCD. And when every new quantum field, you get new particles. In this case, the particle is called the axion. Axions are especially popular because they're great dark matter candidates. And that's because they're extremely elusive. They interact with the electromagnetic field only very weakly. We discussed the prospects of axionic dark matter in that same previous vid. But axions can only be dark matter if they make up around 80% of the mass of the universe. And that's only possible if they were produced in pretty ridiculous numbers right after the Big Bang. Even if these things don't solve the dark matter problem, we really want to know if they exist because of the less famous, but still vexing, strong CP problem. Oh, and axions are pretty generic predictions of string theory, so if you want the latter, you probably also want the former. Now, we've been looking for axions in various ways, but it's tricky because of that very weak electromagnetic interaction. But axions do have an unusual EM interaction that might give them away. Axions sometimes do this thing where they convert into photons, and photons sometimes convert into axions, in both cases in the presence of strong magnetic fields. This could have a number of effects, like allowing us to shine light through a solid wall by using magnets to flip photons into axions and then back again. Various experiments to dissect this phenomenon haven't found anything, but that could be because we can't generate magnetic fields strong enough. We expect the rate of conversion between axions and photons to be very sensitive to magnetic field strength, and more magnetic field would be better. But we don't know the lower limit of that field strength in order to get a detectable signal. The strength of the fields used in modern axion detection experiments maxes out at around 10 tesla, and the current world record magnetic field is 45 tesla. Not bad but piddling compared to what certain space magnets are able to generate. Take magnetars, a type of neutron star that has cranked its magnetic field up to the vicinity of 10 billion tesla. If axions were not produced prodigiously in the Big Bang, neutron stars may be our universe's most efficient axion factories. But that's only true if they meet certain fairly specific conditions. Let's start with the conditions needed to produce axions. First is the strong magnetic field. In certain neutron stars, we definitely have that. It's why we chose them in the first place. Second is a prodigious source of photons to convert into axions. Actually, the requirement is a bit more stringent than that. Axions can be produced when they have a time-varying electric field that is parallel to its magnetic field. Now, a photon is a single quantum of oscillating electric field with a perpendicular magnetic field that moves with it. If you send photons into an external magnetic field, in some cases, the photon's electric and the external magnetic fields line up, and you should produce axions. If we want a lot of axions, we need a lot of photons. And the most promising way to do that with neutron stars is with the large-scale electric fields that those stars may generate, rather than with individual photons. Early neutron star models suggest that a very strong electric field should be generated due to the rotation of the neutron star relative to its magnetic field. This is related to the effect of a standard electrical generator where rotation of conducting material in a magnetic field generates current. In a neutron star, a component of the electric field generated this way should be in the direction 
of the magnetic field. Now, we'll come back to the requirement that the electric field be time-varying. First, we should take a closer look at this requirement for parallel electric and magnetic fields. Why? Because nature hates that. Nature does its very best to resist the electric field becoming parallel to the magnetic, which means nature seems to want to shut down axial production, and it does this in a couple of ways. First, this electric field we just generated tends to rip charges from the surface of the neutron star, upon which those charges rearrange themselves to neutralize the parallel component of the electric field. Secondly, when the strength of the electric field gets high enough, we expect a phenomenon similar to the formation of lightning. Under extreme voltages, insulating materials can suddenly become conductors in a process known as electrical breakdown. When charge builds up in storm clouds, electrical breakdown in the air results in the flow of massive currents, aka lightning. Well, the vacuum is a pretty good insulator, but it can also break down under extreme voltages, at least theoretically. The result of this vacuum breakdown is the production of many pairs of electrons and positrons, and in the neutron star, these would work to short out the electric field, and so could potentially put an end to axial production. Now, nature may want to shut down our axion factory, but neutron stars are so extreme that they may be able to manage it anyway. The region of extreme magnetic field around a neutron star is called the magnetosphere. There, the super-intense magnetic field co-rotates with the star, up to several hundred times per second in some cases. The further we get from the neutron star, the faster the magnetic field lines have to sweep through space in order to keep up with the rapidly spinning surface of the star. At a certain point, those magnetic field lines will have to move faster than the speed of light to keep up. And so, they don't. The field lines lag behind the surface, and they lag behind the field lines in the magnetosphere, resulting in these helical magnetic fields trailing off into space, all of which arise from regions around the neutron star's magnetic poles, the polar caps. Magnetic fields that twist like this will induce the flow of currents, that's Ampere's law. So charged particles get lifted from the magnetosphere at the polar cap region and travel along these helical field lines and then sprayed into space. Now, remember that an excess of charged particles can shut down our electric field, whether they are particles lifted from the surface or generated in the vacuum breakdown. So now we have a way to drain those particles into space, which means we might be able to rescue our axion factory. So do we get axions or do we? Well, bring together everything I described, we end up with a hellishly complex process that is very difficult to fully explore with just pen and paper. The only way to properly figure this out is to build neutron stars in our computers with something called plasma particle and cell simulations. And the answer seems to be that nature fails to thwart our axion production. In particular, the vacuum breakdown is extremely bursty. An avalanche of pair production shorts the parallel electric fields temporarily, but then the field switches back on. This actually leads to exactly what you want for axial production, a rapidly fluctuating electric field. Another really interesting thing is that the electric field oscillations are associated with the emission of powerful electromagnetic waves. And indeed, neutron stars do emit such waves in the form of intense radio jets of pulsars. Now, we've never fully understood the source of these jets, and so these new simulations may do two things. Explain the observed radio jets and give us our axion source. However, once generated, the radio photons and axions follow markedly different paths. Radio waves are strongly beamed. They swivel with the magnetic poles in narrow cones, leading to the pulsations that we observe when the beam sweeps across our line of sight. Axions, by contrast, can shoot off in all directions. They convert back to radio waves in some cases, in directions way off the standard pulsar beam. This actually gets us to a prediction that might allow us to test for axion production. If axions can lead to radio waves being launched in random directions, not just with the standard pulsar beam, then we should expect neutron stars to glow over a wide spectrum of radio frequencies at all times. And they don't. Some of the most sensitive radio telescopes in the world, including Arecibo in Puerto Rico, Parks in Australia, and the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, have been staring at pulsars for the past 50 years, 
And those pulsars are pretty radio dark, besides the regular blips of the radio beams. But this darkness has allowed scientists to get some of the strongest constraints on axions to date, using observations from 27 nearby neutron stars. Even if the axions produced by a neutron star aren't immediately detectable through the conversion of radio waves, there is one more way we can spot them. Around 90% of axions created by a neutron star are expected to escape into space, with some of them being converted into photons on the way. But the other 10% are created with velocities below the escape velocity of the neutron star, which means they fall back and end up orbiting the star. And by the way, the escape velocity of a neutron star is around half the speed of light, so even the captured axions can be traveling pretty fast. These trapped axions build up in this increasingly dense cloud around the star over thousands or millions of years, and that axion cloud might have a few observable effects. 1. They might explain another mysterious phenomenon called nulling, where the pulsar's radio emission is temporarily suppressed. 2. They might result in bright radio emission, which I already told you we don't see in neutron stars, but the radio light from these captured axion clouds would have a much narrower frequency range, and it may have rendered it undetectable in past searches. And 3. When a neutron star's magnetic field eventually fades out over tens to hundreds of millions of years, these axion clouds may evaporate in a burst of radio emission that may last millions of years or may only last a fraction of a second. If the latter, the models show that these would bear a striking resemblance to the mysterious fast radio bursts, distant and stupendously bright radio flashes that have perplexed astronomers for years. So there are a few radio signatures that might reveal this axion cloud, and radio astronomers are already working to pin these down, while pulsar experts are trying to model these processes in more sophisticated ways to see if they really do match the observations, for example, of this nulling phenomenon or false radio bursts. And future radio facilities like the Square Kilometer Array may reveal axionic radio signatures that are currently undetectable. I should add, that if neutron stars do produce axions, they don't produce nearly enough to explain all of dark matter. We'd still need a lot of axions produced in the early universe to achieve that. But if axions are even one component of dark matter, then having dark matter factories in the modern universe could be pretty helpful for finding and studying the stuff. To summarize, axions may or may not exist, but if they do, then there's a very good chance that neutron stars pump them out in enormous quantities, and that neutron stars are also cloaked in clouds of these strange particles, and that axions may even explain pulsar radio jets and fast radio bursts. Well, that's a lot of ifs, but if these ifs work out, then the payoff is huge. It'll be a step beyond the stands in model, and perhaps will give us at least one of the components of dark matter. Definitely worth keeping our eye on the neutron stars to see what strange things are being formed in those tiny patches of curved 